And so certainly I wouldn't call it controversial, but a an challenging and interesting topic that we are discussing here with people material transfer, or as we have learned from Canada, there may be, it may be better to use some other terminology to make it appear at least immediately more positive. Again, like I did in the morning, uh, first of all, my name is Klaus Hellmann, for those who uh, join only now, uh, from Munich, Germany, from Klipfebet, um, and I'm the pleasure here to, to run through this afternoon here. Um, I just wanted to do a few things and summarize a little bit well where how does it uh, how, how does fecal material transfer work so set the scene a little bit not fully understood yet i guess so uh, we don't know exactly what's the content of it so i think that's probably a major driving part of that so batch to batch correct uh, uh, consistency we can only reach if we fully if we are fully able to characterize and then identify the ingredients and characterize the product so then we also don't know where, if there is an effect, and that obviously we have seen data that there is potentially certain, there are certain effects, but we can't really delegate it to the individual ingredients. So which microorganisms or even other ingredients uh, may be essential to reach any effect, but either may it be good, beneficial, efficacy normally, or may it be harmful, and that would be a safety concern. Yeah, and how to ensure if we want to use this as a product or a therapy or whatever we would like to define it, how do we ensure that it definitely doesn't do harm? So I think that's the interest that we all have. So um, I guess most of those who have been uh, here looking into this technology are aware uh, that there were, uh, I think earlier this year, some reports from the US. So FDA classifies this uh, also as an investigational drug, uh, issued a safety alert, risk of serious or life-threatening infections because two patients died following receipt of fecal material transfer product from a donor associated with Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So it's kind of very near to the pathogen we are talking about here. Um, and um, so they consider this as a risky procedure, especially for immunosuppressed patients. And as this technology, we discussed that earlier in human medicine is probably often used as a last source of, of therapy. Of course, we very frequently talk about immunosuppressed patients. So FDA recommends doctors to enforce adequate consent from patients on the investigational treatment and potential risks. Well, here we are in Europe, so we all know in the US, the potential suing of, uh, of, of physicians is a, is a very, very high risk. And therefore this is uh, here the, the major consequence, but of course it's also to be very careful and only use this kind of theory as uh, th uh, therapy where it is appropriate. So purpose of FMT in human medicine is pretty much linked to just treating one specific pathogen, although we just heard about uh, another one. So Aztec here, it's uh, C. difficile. So the question is, are these pathogens really of importance in veterinary medicine? Something to be discussed, do we really need it? Uh, in veterinary medicine, uh, fecal material transfer is described as potential therapeutic, prophylactic, or immunogenic. Uh, therapeutic options, and uh, Megan explained us today quite nicely um, her view on that and her work that is, she's doing in Kansas State. So can this basically open new windows and opportunities where we also may be able to persuade uh, yeah, regulators or rather our politicians to install some, um, some options how it could be regulated because of course, uh, I think just to set the scene here right, it's not the regulated make, regulators making the regulations, it's done in a democracy by parliament. Uh, so the regulators have the job to follow that regulation and not the opposite. Anyway, they often do a lot of interpretation and therefore they have uh, uh, certainly are a relevant uh, player to this field. So anyway, we stressed a lot here, the regulation 2019-6, as long as we would uh, define that as a medicinal treatment. And I think that it, it is probably what it is. So, but then uh, we also saw as an example here from Germany, from the uh, Frankfurt and Cologne hospital, uh, it is categorized as a medicine in Germany, clearly, but of course you don't need a full regulation, so they only require them to produce it to a certain standard. And it is not always the same, and I think that was the interesting learning of that, so you do not always need in personalized medicine, and we have that much more on the human side, uh, introduced there the manufacturing is controlled, but not the use, or you don't need a full registration. 
but it is then again under the term of the magistral formulation uh, formula. So basically, yes, there is a uh, doctor to prescribe it, and it needs to be then manufactured to a certain standard to assure the safety for the patients. Um, I think it fits there also in the veterinary legislation, but of course, uh, if that really is for mass use then in farms, that what we are talking about here is another question. But anyway, we'll have a discussion on that and I'll close here uh, my sharing and uh, I would like again to invite all of uh, the speakers who are present here. So it's mainly Mirja and uh, two colleagues from Denmark, please. Uh, and I think the others will be online. What else do I have to do here that this? No, it's not. We need the Zoom, uh, I guess, to be shared. Um, I don't know. Anyway, mm. I leave it to somebody who knows it. So, ah, sorry, Thomas. <laughs> okay, good. So while they are still working on the technology, round. Um, again, I myself started already, so I pass it on to you, Thomas, you are next to me. Uh, just a few, just another very short introduction. We need micros, you are right. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Yeah, my name is uh, Thomas Thuman. I'm a professor of uh, comparative veterinary pediatrics uh, at University of Copenhagen, and I've been here for approximately 20 years uh, with an interest in um, early life of, of piglets, partly for the sake of piglets, but also as model, uh, models of human infants. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Mirja Hukkinen. I'm a veterinarian uh, working for Oreo Corporation uh, as a uh, director of animal health R&D. I've been working there for about 22 years almost and developing drugs for, for animals, but also very interested in, in microbiome technology and products. Hello, my name is Lotte Dale Nissen and uh, I'm from the Danish Medicines Agency, very interested in this field of products. Martin Rysiewicz, a vet also from the Danish Medicines Agency. And we have two speakers online. Uh, thank you for joining. So uh, maybe uh, first of all, introducing Jordi Torren from EMA, who is kind of representing now EMA. I, I assume, uh, Jordi, I can say it like this, as uh, you are non now online. So we ask that pretty soon. So many thanks to join here uh, as uh, Xavier can't uh, stay. Uh, maybe you start and then Alexandra. Um. Thank you. Yes, uh, Javier unfortunately couldn't stay this afternoon, but I'm Jordi Turan, Head of the Department of Evaluation and Innovation at the Veterinary Medicine, at the European Medicines Agency, and I'm in charge of the evaluation of veterinary medicinal products. I'm very interested also in innovative products. Thank you very much. And Alexandra, please. Hello, so my name is Alexandre Thibodeau. I'm from the University of Montreal and in the campus of saint Science. So I'm a microbiologist and I'm interested mostly in foodborne pathogens and how they interact with the microbiota. So we've been conducting a lot of experiments on how to modify the microbiota, which microbiota seems favorable or not with uh, foodborne pathogens. And like I said during my talk, I've also been doing some a bit of FMT work to, to try to understand how and what kind of bacteria can implement themselves in the animals, at least the most easily. Yes, thank you very much. So I've been thinking how to structure this, uh, this uh, discussion here. So I would maybe structure it in three parts, if you agree. First, maybe we talk a little bit where we would see this product uh, or this kind of product in the current regulatory system, and then look a little bit into quality and probably safety aspects of, of these things. So we did the same with the phages to a certain extent this morning. So maybe I ask the first question here, maybe we start in Europe. Uh, uh, may, may I ask one of you two, uh, Martin or... Um, 
Lotte. Lotte. Lotte, yes, thank you. Um, maybe one of you could could state how, how that is handled or how that is, would be currently categorized in the Danish uh, legislation, because I guess on the European level, I'll ask the question to Jordi later on as well, but uh, I already gave some hints. Um, yes, with, with the current experience with, with this product, we are trying to, to take the most facilitating approach. Um, so, so we are trying to make a case by case decision um, to let the product when it is not manipulated um, be addressed as a subject of human origin. I, I will only cover now the, the human side because that's where my experience is. So we will try to approach it as a subject of human origin as a, a tissue and that is then regulated under the, the Tissue Act. And it's actually then not within the um, jurisdiction of the Danish Medicines Agency, but the um, Agency for Patient Safety, which is also covering the blood banks and the tissue preparation units. When you then can define that there is one um, uh, uh, active substance um, that can be turned into a medicinal product, then the full um, medicinal product legislation applies, and that is then within the jurisdiction of the Danish Medicines Agency. That is how we, we, we try to, to support the development in this field. But it's difficult because it, you, uh, you can land between um, different agencies and it's very much dependent on good communication and uh, also the training of the people in the agency. Thank you. Any comments from you, Martin? Lotte, you told me you have some experience in Germany as well and with the Paul Ehrlich Institute. So uh, do, you, do you know uh, how they, or would you like to comment on how they, uh, in Germany, the situation seems to be a little bit different as we also saw. So, so it falls under the drug legislation. Yeah, it, it's funny that you ask because I would uh, like to explain why it's not under the um, Paul Ehrlich Institute, who is actually responsible for the biologicals. And that is due to history, because uh, the Paulerdic Institute takes care of the, uh, only the products that is defined as the area of jurisdiction when Paulerdic was founded, and B Farm has the rest. <laughs> so there is always difficulties in Germany. And I've been working at the Paulerdic Institute. It's, it's really strange, but that's, that's the reason why. But the Paulerdic Institute says this is not our area even though that is it's, uh, truly a biological. So it's also for, for small um, molecules, et cetera. That's no, we have the same, yeah. yeah. It's very clear, yes. It's only immunologicals and serum. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it's defined as a medicinal uh, product in Germany with, with the highest uh, control. Yeah. So now moving on to Jordi, the European perspective. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Well, it, it's really very difficult to say which is the, the first, how we will address it at, at the level of centrally authorized product. Right now, we don't have any, any experience, as far as I know, with those types of products. So we will be talking about something quite new for us. Um, I don't think we have guidance also, from what I know, on the area. And it will be a question of having um, a question to the agency via ITF, scientific advice, or some of the other routes that we mentioned in order for us to trigger some kind of meaningful discussion on, on, in, in those products. Until now, my perception is one of the main problems is the lack of characterization and repeatability of those products. So what I've seen also until now, it's products that change quite a lot. So, so I think that if, if it will be for a centrally authorized product, something will have to be characterized and reproducible. Thank you. Yes, I think that's that's certainly true. We cannot uh, register something where we don't know what it is. So that's unlikely that it will ever be registered. I think we all agree on that one. Now the question is a little bit, I think the... the, the uh, 
therapeutic kind of intervention, if we call it an intervention and not a therapeutic uh, medication. This is something, at least from my own experience, in the early 90s, we had the purse coming along and certainly, yes, we, uh, the, we recommended as veterinarians, the farmers to take the feces from the infected animals to present it to the sows. And that uh, had uh, in some farms a uh, clear effect on reduced uh, stillbirth rates and stuff like this. So we could at least observe it. But of course, that were not controlled studies. Yeah, so later we got the vaccines, but they were the first things they were able to do. So I think for me, that is a very traditional way, first of all, to, 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 to use. But now what we still don't know is really what's active in there what generates the activity that we are observing. And of course, we need to dedicate that for certain things. And the question is, yes, how do we get nearer to that? So on the one side, we have we could argue this is biological material. We have a lot of other biological materials, but we then characterize them. And we say, well, do an HPLC or whatever, tell us what are the peaks here? This is a little bit difficult, I guess, with <laughs> biological material like pieces. Like you can probably do it, but you have probably thousands of peaks. So, any ideas here to the group how we could more characterize that? How, how uh, obviously, Mireille, you have uh, or on the broil act pathway, you have identified microorganisms. But what other, there are other ingredients in there, there's no doubt, I guess, even in your filtrate. Yes, I, I, I guess it's uh, the DNA sequencing is, is the I mean, method of today to identify yes. what's exactly in, in there. If you think about bacteria or viruses or or pages or other. But in your case, you have finally, yeah, you have, have created master seeds. You, you explained us in the presentation. So, um, but then you also do a formulation of the product, obviously. Um, so is, is there anything else in no globulins or anything like this? Because we can imagine that there's a lot more in feces than just some microorganisms which could also be beneficial. Yeah, it's, it's certain, certainly the, the more information we gain, I mean, the, the understanding of, of the immunological function of, of the microbes in the gut, yeah. and so the host interaction is, is becoming more and more important. And it's not just who is there, but what they are doing. Yes, so what's, that's what's the next step. Yes, yes. Of course. so the metagenomics is another yeah. approach. Thomas, where are you on doing, working on this in our project here? <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've done a number of uh, 16S characterizations and also metagenomics, but um, but but uh, um, it, it sounds like an endless task just to characterize something uh, like feces. Uh, uh, it sounds right, but it's practically impossible. Uh, uh, so so uh, and it's going to vary from donor to donor and from week to week and from feed to feed. So, so um, it's, uh, to me, it sounds hard to, to, to uh, search for a characterization of feces in that sense. But then at the same time, Alexandra showed us pretty, pretty nicely that you can clearly see an effect, but it's very much dependent on the donor animal. So we have completely different levels there. If I understood your presentation correct, Alexandra. Yes, it depends on the donors. It also depends on the sow. Um, is it possible to characterize a microbiota? Uh, definitely, but you have to do it into, uh, as a lab, you have to build up, do the same protocols, gather the same material, and eventually you will hit a core microbiota that you can associate with different outcome. And then from that, I guess you can start to choose and pick some, you know, relevant population uh, and then to start manipulate. But we are still like, bit of wizards right now we're just trying to see what's happening i don't think we're at the step where we can truly go and say we have this wonderful product unless to step upon like the orion showed us that you you know they step on something that was very good and they they, they capitalize on that but for now it's just too early to say well you need that that kind of that proportion of lactobacillus that proportion of bifidobacterium and then even if you want to go deeper, you need, well, I need this specific strain and that specific strain. We're not there yet, but as a whole, we can characterize it. I'm pretty sure you can. And if you use like things like uh, networks, 
you can see what are the cornerstones of your population and try to build on the links that are in the in the, the, the transplant to at least get the major families that are, you know, acting on each other on a positive way. Thank you. There was a hand raised, I think, in the uh, on the uh, on the non-present uh, participants here. Please speak up. Uh, there was somebody who wanted to talk to us. I can't see it here. Okay, then maybe I take the opportunity, meanwhile, uh, to ask the auditorium here for some questions. Oh, do you hear me, Alexandra? Yeah, oh, yeah, please repeat the question. I didn't hear it. Yeah, sorry. sorry. I didn't get the mic. Yeah. Uh, no, I was thinking about uh, how you look at the situation about using fecal uh, transplantation in, in practice in, and the legal constraints and, and maybe also another view than in Europe because you look, use backfeeding, so-called backfeeding uh, a lot. And actually, it's also used in Europe. That means... Uh, using a piglet uh, feces to immunize sows. But do you think it would be feasible in, uh, in a country like Canada or? Well, I guess, uh, well, it's already being done, like you said, that you use pig feces to feed the sows to induce immunity. Also, there's also, I know about a company, what they did is that their, their small piglets for the replacements of their sows, they had a bad microbiota, so they do fecal transplant on these animals to mature them. Uh, for now, as a... <sighs> The way I see it to, to do it in a commercial point of view is that each, we have some integration companies here in Canada and that for these companies that are very integrated, I guess it would be easy to have like a stable source of fecal matter to give into different kind of situation. So it would be easier to do it like an on-farm on basis. So uh, these big, producing facility they can have no animals that they keep and then you use that for a thesis but in terms of regulation for a, an outsider company uh, it's the same thing as in european union i would go for feed additive uh, claim because it would be a lot easier to 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 market and the, the feed additive companies in canada they're not as you know as rich as for the human side so you need to pump less money into research and development also. So I guess the way I would go. Okay, thank you. Any other um, questions here from the auditorium? So this morning I asked uh, the, the representative Lotte and, uh, and Martin uh, um, about uh, what are the chances basically of getting uh, phage, uh, uh, the phage uh, mix developed by Michaela tested in 2023 in Denmark. I could ask the same question, but probably would uh, uh, get a, a similar answer. But now that you have heard the state of the art in the two uh, topics, uh, which of the two alternatives is in, in uh, pole position? <laughs> Maybe Jordi can also express his opinion if he has uh, one. Sure, sure, I can start at least. So uh, I guess you would expect me to say that, for example, phages are because they are better understood and so forth. But I think actually now having heard about this feed additive uh, pathway, which I wasn't so informed about before, I would say that even with the uh, probiotic or fecal transplant or whatever you want to call it, as long as you have a, a clear target product profile, as long as you have a good indication and you have a medical need and, and, and you have like a, a commercial viability of the product, I, I think you would have a good chance with that also, perhaps in, in the in, in the feed additive pathway. And similarly, I think again, that if, if you work with, with phage therapy, then this is a good time to, to be about it again, because we have this movement in the, in the regulatory areas. So, so I think both these areas, and obviously they're biologically very closely related, 
both these areas, I think, are actually very well positioned also now with the new veterinary regulative, which uh, Javier reminded us is, is coming into effect uh, in January, where, the, where there is this large focus on, on reducing uh, the use of antibiotics and, and taking action against the microbial resistance. So I think both areas actually are, are in good shape. Jordi, do you want to comment as well on this question from Luca? Mm, well, <laughs> when, when Luca asked us to present about the bacteriophage uh, regulations and the FMT, we kindly declined to present the FMT. And I think in our case, we clearly have more information or experience right now with the bacteriophages. Having said that, it's also true that that could change tomorrow if there is a valid product, but, and, and that we certainly are looking for innovative products, especially considering the importance of alternative to antimicrobials. I think that that's something we are all quite focused right now and try to reduce the overall use of antibiotics. And we will really favor any kind of opportunity to, to promote that. And, and, I, and I, I notice what is being mentioned about the cost of scientific advice, you know, and I'm wondering if we can do something about that because certainly for products like um, alternative to antimicrobials, it will be good if we could, you know, try to support uh, the development of those types of products. But in a nutshell, I think that bacteriophages will be on the on the on the pole position. Thank you. Thomas, do you have the No, I wanted to ask, uh, to ask uh, Jordi if we want to kick off a similar process like you are doing now with phage uh, therapy, so the, the generation of a document uh, for guidance purposes, what would be the, the, the path uh, to, to follow? And that's a very good question, and I've been wondering myself how to put it on the table. <laughs> and I think that that might be the start of it, you know. <laughs> Maybe Avant could claim in a few years that you were the ones who put it into the table. I'll certainly report back at home and I'll report about the discussions we are having and maybe that's, that's a trigger to put it into the table. Certainly the other way that could help us is to have companies asking us, how are you intending to regulate those products? I have an intention to submit a product how can I regulate it? That's what really triggers us. That's what put the whole machinery, you know, in function. Thank you. Lotte? Um, I can just supplement that on uh, the, in the human uh, region, there is a, a recent um, survey paper um, for the practices on FMT in the different countries, trying to collect uh, how the products are categorized as treatment or as medicinal product. Um, so that is also just early being put into put on the table uh, how the different countries are, are managing it. Thomas? Yes, uh, <clears throat> inspired by your talk, uh, Mirja, uh, about the Broilac uh, product where you spray it on the feathers of the poultry. Uh, would that offer a way uh, to, um, if we develop a fraction of feces that could be sprayed onto either the the floor of the pig pen or the udder of the of the mammary gland of the sow, such that they uh, consume it, uh, the, the newborn piglets. Would that be a way to to get around the regulatory constraints? Um, maybe this is a question really to to uh, Martin. Yes, well, well, I guess the application of these products under feed additive regulation, but which is not broiled, we have to keep that in mind. So. I think for feed additives, that, that is definitely opened, uh, that you can also apply to eggs, basically, then, and that's a very typical way to uh, apply vaccines to, to, uh, to chicken, yeah, at the first day of life, so basically, or when they are just hatching. So I think that's reasonable clear. In the feed additive area, it's a little bit more vague, but I think uh, they have recently opened that kind of door that you can do that and that it is uh, seen as an oral application uh, into the egg as well, and it is seen as, uh, as, as feeding. Um, so in that way, yes, you could potentially do. The question, of course, is I think there, that we, you, you still run, as least, as least as I see it, reading just the new German legislation. So whatever you apply to an animal, which is not then covered clearly outside 
uh, as, a, as a different product, I, we talked about that yesterday, so either falling under the definition of a feed additive or a biocide, because topical could be a biocide as well, you could imagine sort of things, but um, if that is for treating a disease, then you are back in, definitely in medicines, and where, the, where it's not clear, you are also in a medicine, so that's always the thing, you have to be very clear to, to argue on that. But if we don't claim anything, do then, we have to claim? We don't have to claim necessarily anything, do we? I guess that's a little bit uh, also with Broilect, where you try to keep out of these definitions. Yeah. But of course, then you can't claim, and that has an impact on commercialization. So, um, and Broilect has been done, we learned today from the 70s or 80s, certainly. So, that was a completely different regulatory scenery as we have it now. So, you cannot compare it. And there are lots of products from that time, which is which are partly still existing, with a very low amount of data created. Yeah, kind of traditional use, whatever. Uh, there are certain ways to keep them on the market, often uh, based on the fact that they have been licensed and didn't don't create problems. I would call safety profile is fine. So you cannot compare that for a new product. It will always be current level and not level of the eighties. Any other comments on that? Questions from the audience here. Avant Group, Paul, uh, can somebody just reach out with a micro? Well, as one could argue on FMT, first of all, it's not a product. It will never be commercialized. It's a procedure that every farmer can use by himself. So it's not a product claiming anything. So it's not a medical product. And then you can argue that it's not even a feed additive because it's, it's not to be put into the feed, neither into the water. And that's in legal, as I read the legislation, a feed additive is to be put into the feed or into the water. You don't put it into the feed, neither into the water. So as I see it, this procedure, it's not a product, this procedure, which no one will earn money on apart from the farmer, if it's efficient in reducing something or uh, having more healthy animals, it's, it's, it, it's neither a, a, a EMA concern and it's neither a EFSA concern. It falls between these two uh, entities, in my opinion. Thank you. Francesc. I'm getting to be sportive here today. Thanks, Klaus. I have a question for Alexandra. You show us the trial where you did the combination of heavy piglets and lighter piglets. And then you show us that in lighter piglets, the response was different than the heavy piglets. Could it be linked to the dose that you gave that in, in, in those, yeah, as if you overdose, uh, you can create dysbiosis. Did you play with the dose or, or uh, less days of, uh, of inoculation, let's say, to, to see if you can uh, get similar results with the heavy peaks or do you think it's more linked to, yeah, to the maturation of the animals and yeah, there's no link to a dose, let's say. Thanks. Uh, that's a very tough question, actually. Uh, we did not vary the dose because we treated everybody together. So that could be something happening. I don't know if Milen is here, but I also have some uh, insight on immune systems that these animals are less performing. So yeah, definitely maybe they're, there's too much for them or it's not adapt or it's the combination with, you know, they're tinier, so they take less milk and they... It can be anything, but one thing is sure is that if you're in the field, you have to take into account of these two categories of animals uh, to be successful, even as a procedure. There's something happening and you need to know that this is happening. 
Thank you. Luca, do you have another yes, question? Yes. Um, I fully support the, 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 the idea uh, raised by, by Paul that uh, fecal transplantation is neither a, a medicine uh, uh, nor a, a medicated, uh, uh, sorry, um, feed. Um, and I understand that in Denmark, actually, differently from Germany, where there is this GMP issue that was mentioned by Maria, uh, it is regulated as, uh, as such. But, and you said that it's outside the, the, the competence, uh, the area of competence of the Danish uh, medicine agency. You mentioned this other agency patient uh, who is also responsible for the blood. Uh, yeah, but there is not such an equivalent uh, for, for veterinary medicine. So what, what would be the, the, the first agency that we have to contact in order to, again, kick off the process? My guess would be that, that, that here in Denmark, it would make most sense to, to contact the medicines agency. And then we can always refer you on if it turns out, out that, that, uh, that we are not responsible. And, and my advice would be to obviously state your question very clearly. So, so it's quite clear what it is that you're asking about and also state your own position very clearly and, and try to justify your position, explain exactly why you believe what it is that you believe and, and then we can take it from there. So for example, one example would be that, that as Lotte mentioned, we get quite a lot of, of uh, inquiries regarding people coming in and asking, we have this product X, is this a medicinal product? So you might fall in that category, for example. I can just supplement that that is an advice uh, free of charge um, when you come with such questions. Um, but I have a bit of a different opinion since it is also forming the agencies what we uh, learn about the products. And sometimes for the new product, you can fall into older legislations. So I think that you in this field, you can learn from also reading into the human experience and both sides can learn from, from that and human. And, and you, I think you should approach the, the authorities broadly because they need to understand the product in order to define their own regulation. But um, we are also learning in the medicines agency and uh, it is a good approach also to contact us uh, regarding the definition, but also uh, the crew who asked you also. Yeah. Yes, please. The arm is probably not long enough. <laughs> Yeah, so Mia Kerr from uh, Wagner Livestock Research. Uh, I have a question for Alexandra. I think uh, you have uh, in your presentation uh, rightly, uh, let's say, uh, took off the flag for the parasite part. And my question is a little bit, uh, let's say, from scientific point of view. Um, could, would you like to reflect a little bit more on that? Because I, I think you will also agree to the fact that it will help in the characterization process, which is again going to the dossier for making it much more uh, yeah, regulatory uh, offices would like to see that as well. So I'd like to hear a little bit your comment about it. Oh, yes, on the parasite, it's, uh, it's something very important. We didn't have any issue in swine, but I know a colleague of mine who did uh, an experiment in chickens and basically what he went for, he said, oh, where is the best diverse microbiota that I can find? Well, the answer is simple. It's in an organic farm. So let's go into an organic farm, gather the microbiota and use that. But on organic farms, you may have a very good microbiota, but you'll have tons of sneaky foodborne pathogens waiting. And you'll have, of course, emeria in case of chickens. And then when he gave the microbiota to the, to the, the chicks, I mean, he got emeria outbreaks like there's no tomorrow, high mortality. And <laughs> that was not very good. So the same could happen in, in animals. I mean, if you have C. difficile in pigs and then you enter, you know, you give them something bad, they're going to do necrotic enteritis and you're not very well. So you need to make sure that your animals are 
healthy. They have a very big story of being healthy. And don't forget the parasites, they're quite sneaky. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, certainly, wherever you would like to define a herd or animals, then you should definitely have them under a certain definition of SPF. So that only means for free of certain pathogens. It doesn't mean it needs to be free of all pathogens, but you need to have it very well defined and controlled and long-term controlled. And that's kind of the same we have, for example, if we use animals, horses, for example, for cereal production, it's all the same definitions, basically. It's very clearly defined how you have to keep them. Uh, we had a similar, I think a similar example is stem cell production. We have other biological materials where that also is very clearly defined and where we have, of course, even vendor animals uh, under normal or under kind of normal conditions kept, but you need to standardize that. Uh, and that's the question how we can standardize then, yeah, also the feces here including, uh, of course, from a pathogen status, that maybe sounds as the easier one, but then also of a content status. So I think we have both. And again, we talk about certain kind of characterization. Um, I guess that's where everybody's looking for. Um, and uh, it's a big task to do it in a material like feces because it is so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so broad defined and we have so many different content. Uh, so I guess that's the big challenge. Uh, I just wanted to, to make a comment here on, on Paul's thing. I think at least here in this group, we have also discussed that feed in the feed regulation, we have certain an argument that it is not allowed to place feed, uh, sorry, feces on the market, but that's something different than using it on the farm. I just want to make here the difference as well. The legislation, as far as I'm aware, defines you are not allowed to place feces on the market, and that means commercialization. If a farmer does it in-house, then it's not automatically done, but there may be other regulations based on hygiene and, and also in the individual countries and in other pieces of legislation that may limit that. So, and that's to be checked for. Yeah. Okay. Um, if any further questions, then I would first of all, thank all uh, my colleagues here on the panel, both this morning as this afternoon. Um, I enjoyed to lead you through these questions. I hope it was not too stressful. Um, and uh, I pass back here to uh, Luca. And I hope, yeah, for all the Avant people that we have a good further discussions on this. So it's not an easy one. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Klaus. Uh...